Have you ever received an email from an unknown source informing you of great news? You're a grand prize winner. Just click on the link to receive your prize. Or maybe it was a phone call. The person says they have exciting news. You've just won something of value. But hurry, limited time only. All you have to do is provide your personal information. Well, sadly, the great and exciting news usually doesn't turn out as presented, does it? This highlights that no matter the form or method that we receive it, much of the news and information we're given today misleads, misinforms, and often leaves us disappointed. Our world is just saturated with bad news. Even just watching the local news could leave us feeling anxious, depressed, even fearful. So it's no wonder that when people actually do receive good news, they're often skeptical, feeling that if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. The Bible tells us it's actually wise to be cautious about the news we believe. But it also tells us that there is news, good news, that we can trust. This is William Turner. He's a helper to the service committee and he is handling the final talk on the Sunday morning, essentially the public talk of the convention, I think. Have faith in the good news. The purpose of this talk seems to be to pitch the Jehovah's Witness religion to outsiders who may be in the audience. So whereas nearly every other talk we've heard are uniquely written or delivered with Jehovah's Witnesses in mind, especially David Splain's rant against apostates, there's a different tone in this talk, and that's because William Turner is trying to sell the Jehovah's Witness religion to any who may be tuning in to this virtual convention, perhaps as a result of having been invited by friends or family who are Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're not Jehovah's Witnesses themselves. And it's quite an interesting introduction where he gives these examples of things that seem too good to be true and probably very likely are too good to be true. Let's look at both of those examples. Example number one. Have you ever received an email from an unknown source informing you of great news you're a grand prize winner. Just click on the link to receive your prize. I think most of us receive emails like that all the time. And what I would do if I received an email like that telling me that I'd won some prize is, well, first of all, I'd check the language. I'd see whether there was any evidence of this being just a circular that's being worded in such a way as to make it sound personal, even though it isn't. I would also take a look at the send from address, because usually there would be some clue in the send from address that this is a spam email. In other words, there are any number of ways that you can check a spam email like this to find out whether it's authentic or not, you're certainly not going to just accept it on face value that what it's offering is legit. Example number two. Or maybe it was a phone call. The person says they have exciting news. You've just won something of value. But hurry, limited time only. All you have to do is provide your personal information. Again, I think we've all been there. I certainly get lots of unsolicited calls of that nature. And I would not allow myself to be hurried. I'd want to know where this person is calling from, what the company is, on what basis I've been selected. Is there a website I can look up? Are there company details I can look up? And on what basis is my personal information being requested? There are any number of avenues of investigation to find out whether what's on offer is legit or not. You do not simply capitulate and hand over personal information based purely on faith. 
But isn't that exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to do? They have to take everything on face value. They have to accept this offer, even though it's seemingly too good to be true, indicating that it more than likely is too good to be true. And they are not allowed to investigate whether they are being scammed or not. The only source of information that they're allowed to look at if they're interested in the Jehovah's Witness message, if they're learning about all this for the first time, is JW.org, which is effectively like saying, if a scam artist approaches you, you should only listen to what the scam artist says or what the scam artist has written on the scam artist's website. Not only is Jehovah going to put an end to death, but know what he does next. Look over at chapter 26, this time verse 19. He says, your dead will live. My corpses will rise up. Awake and shout joyfully, you residents in the dust. For your dew is as the dew of the morning, and the earth will let those powerless in death come to life. So now we're talking about the resurrection. Our dead loved ones will return to life. And you know the expression there, awake and shout joyfully. I thought it was interesting. The New English Bible quotes this as saying, they that sleep in the earth will awake and shout for joy. And doesn't that nicely describe how right now our dead loved ones are just sleeping? And just like an infant is protected within its mother's womb, the dead are in the safest situation imaginable, perfectly preserved and protected within Jehovah's memory. And in God's due time, they will be brought back to life. And we can be there. We can be there to warmly welcome them, just like a newborn is greeted by a loving, waiting family. Speaking of outrageous promises given by scam artists and charlatans and snake oil salesmen that sound too good to be true because they are too good to be true, what do we have here? Exhibit A. Join our religion and you'll see your dead loved ones again. Effectively a reprise of that grotesque talk by William Malenfant in which he showed that awful dramatization which tugged on the heartstrings and emotionally manipulated Jehovah's Witnesses into thinking that if they stay loyal to the organization, if they stay faithful, they'll get to see their dead loved ones again. This is a check that cannot be cashed. This is a promise that is unfalsifiable. There's no way of ever calling out the governing body on this promise, is there? Anyone can make this promise. Oh, follow my religion and you'll get to see your dead loved ones again. How do you ever prove them wrong? How do you ever prove them to be lying? And it's interesting when you think about it that, again, this talk is being given to non-Jehovah's Witnesses. This talk is effectively aimed at people in the audience who've been invited along by their Jehovah's Witness friends and family. And William Turner is effectively giving a pitch to these sorts of people so when he's talking about welcoming back resurrected ones, he's not talking purely about resurrected former Jehovah's Witnesses. Quite clearly, he's describing a resurrection of everyone. <laughs> everyone who dies right up to the beginning of Armageddon. In other words, anyone who doesn't die as a result of Armageddon can be expected back in paradise, in the resurrection, according to current Jehovah's Witness teachings, which if you think about it means a hundred billion people, because it's estimated that there are a hundred billion people who have ever lived, a hundred billion people just popping into existence or back into existence in the paradise earth after Armageddon, that's what's expected. 
As I pointed out in a recent video, in fact, if Tibor is gracious, a thumbnail will appear of my 12 problems with the Jehovah's Witness teaching of paradise. <laughs> How on earth is our planet supposed to cope with its human population ballooning in size to over a hundred billion. I mean, think of how we're struggling now with nearly eight billion and the impact that's having on our planet in terms of climate change and Jehovah's Witnesses or the governing body who are teaching them this nonsense are effectively saying, actually, we can increase. We can increase Earth's population from eight billion to, hmm, let's call it a hundred. Nice round number. <laughs> It's such a preposterous teaching. It's a perfect example of how ultimately you're always going to get found out if you tell lies. Because the lies aren't going to ultimately make sense compared to what's true. The more lies you tell, the more you layer fabrication upon fabrication. And in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, you have all of these interconnected teachings all trying to effectively force a square peg into a round hole to accommodate this two-tier version of Christianity where some go to heaven and some live on a paradise earth in the future. Because none of it ultimately makes sense, the more you zero in on the details, the more the whole thing falls apart. So it's interesting that in a talk that literally began with the example of con artists and people who make offers that are too good to be true, we have an example here of just such a thing. It's a promise that William Turner and his governing body overlords can never be held accountable for and it's a promise that on close inspection simply doesn't make any logical sense.